Now, the cold weather has led to a significant increase in emergency department attendance for both trips and falls, as well as flu, RSV and COVID, as those figures continue to rise. I'm joined in studio now by Colm Henry, Chief Clinical Officer, Chief Clinical Officer for the HSE. Colm, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Pat. Now, uh, tell us about those numbers rising. How significant is the rise? How does it compare to other years? We're seeing a significant surge in COVID-19 and uh, flu cases. Uh, the flu cases are up um, 92% in terms of ED attendances at emergency departments from last week and COVID-19 are up 77%. Wow. Uh, what we have seen compared to uh, last year is a bit of a lag. So the peak in flu cases last year came a couple of weeks earlier. We're expecting the flu cases to peak in the next week or two. But even after the peak, there'll be ongoing number of high cases. The, the graph just doesn't fall down very yeah. quickly. It takes a while to go down. What um, are we learning about this year's flu? I mean, first of all, was the vaccine that uh, most of us got uh, earlier in the winter, uh, was that appropriate to this particular virus? It seems to be effective yep. and certainly could prevent serious illness and that's the message for people. We, we would have preferred if people take it up as early as possible. It's still not too late. We'd encourage anybody who's eligible to come along. The COVID-19 cases, on the other hand, are driven by this new variant. It's not any more virulent or dangerous, but it's more transmissible. This, You remember this phraseology we used during the pandemic, Pat, of growth advantage. It's able to displace the other, the other, the other variants out. It's now the new kid in the block. It's very transmissible, very easy to catch. Um, the, um, and it's waking its way through countries right across Europe and the United States and is now the predominant variant. We expect those cases to remain high right through to the spring. Now, the question of this uh, COVID variant, it is not, as you say, more virulent. It's, it's more transmissible, but people don't get that much uh, sickness from it. Um, what about pe- the, the, the vaccine, again, that many of us got earlier in the winter? Uh, how effective was that against the new variant? Well, to back to your first point, uh, on, on do people get more sick? It doesn't appear to be any more virulent and we're watching that closely, clearly. But the message has always been that if enough people get infected, it finds its way through to somebody who either is not vaccinated or his immune system is not up to scratch. So there's a function of numbers here too that if enough people, even if it's not as serious as those early variants we saw in the pandemic, if enough people get infected, somebody somewhere who's vulnerable will get infected and get sick. Do we have any uh, figures now for the number of people who've had some vaccination? Yeah, we, have, we have percentage figures and uh, what we see is a good level of uptake in long-term care facilities. We've always seen that the highest uptake has always been among older people. If you look at those age over 70 years of age, uh, the uptake of the booster has been just around 60%. For those between 50 and 69, 27%. Now, there is a caveat there. This is for the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. There's a caveat there, of course, that people, if they've, ha- if they've had infection the previous three months, they're, they're That's effectively away. a vaccine. It, it, it's, it's your immune system gets a natural boost. But that said, uh, it, we, the story of the vaccine programme has been from the beginning, huge uptake of the primary vaccine course, highest in Europe and so on. And each successive uh, booster, the uptake and the interest wins. Now, the, the obviously the effectiveness of the vaccine, because we, we do get the boosters, it's not like some of the older vaccines that last for a lifetime or even pneumonococcal, which lasts, what, at least five years. Um, so these uh, need to be boosted from time to time. But that early vaccine, whether it was uh, Moderna or, or Pfizer or AstraZeneca, do they convey some sort of uh, immunity or help? in combating the COVID variants. We do see a, di- a variance. Those who completed the primary vaccination course way back when, yeah. the, the two-dose regime or whatever it was, certainly confers a, 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 a protection against serious illness. However, that said, we know, as you point out, uh, for certain groups, particularly older adults, particularly people who have chronic learned long-term c- conditions, people whose immune system is not up, up to scratch for whatever reason, the immunity wanes over time three months onwards. And that's why when you look at the groups we're focusing on in terms of the, uh, the the booster programme, we're focusing on those groups whose immunity may not have the same robust or sustained response as other as younger people. Now, the other bugs that are out there, obviously we have the, the flu vaccine, which, as you say, has been effective for this year's uh, flu. Uh, RSV, is there a vaccine anywhere for RSV? And if there is, can we have it, please? 
There is one in the making and it's going through what's called a HTA, Health Technology Assessment. It may, depending on, on the outcome of that, that will look, look at the effectiveness of the vaccine. It will look at its cost effectiveness in terms of use for population and look at what groups it may be indicated for. If that comes out with a positive recommendation, there's every chance we could have a vaccine for RSV, either this coming season or the one after. But that depends on the assessment of its effectiveness, its cost and the popul- target population. Now, the question of will it be like a pincushion next year with uh, our RSV vaccine and flu vaccine, COVID booster, whatever. Um, are there talks of combined vaccines? Well, we do give the uh, COVID-19 vaccine booster and the flu vaccine. They're, we're able to give those at the same time. Uh, the, the, uh, the RSV may have a different target population, given that those who are most vulnerable to becoming sick are under five years yeah. of age or even under one years of age. So uh, all this will depend on, on the target population for whom it's recommended. And we have that NIAC, you remember that NIAC that sits mm-hmm. and advises us and our public health authorities as to who should be vaccinated and when. Now, obviously, when you go to any place where there are a number of uh, sick people congregated, whether it's your GP surgery or whether it's a, an A&E or any hospital admission system, well, you're going to be exposed to things. In Spain, they've said anyone going into a hospital now is going to be masked. What do you say? Well, Matt, we've, uh, we, we removed the mandatory use of masks at the end of March in, uh, of this past year. Um, however, masks are still required as a transmission-based precaution when you're dealing with suspected or known COVID-19 cases, for example, uh, for certain medical or surgical procedures. And we've also said very clearly and, and, and emphasised this to all hospitals and healthcare uh, in our daily calls with them, that if there's particular settings such as overcrowded EDs, such as multi-occupancy wards, where you can't be sure that somebody there doesn't have COVID-19, then the default should be for staff and visitors to wear masks. So people will find if they're visiting hospitals, uh, visitors, that they may well be asked to wear a mask in the emergency department and if they do I'd ask them to listen to the authorities and listen to the advice and to comply with what the recommendation is. It's to protect themselves but also they could be carrying something, they could be a carrier and breathing their bugs on a vulnerable person. Well, the message we've always given, Pat, is you never know how close you are to someone who's much more vulnerable than you, whether it's on a Lewis, whether it's on a bus. And, and of course, the primary message, therefore, is if you're sick and you're spewing out virus, please don't uh, be the person who's the agent of transfer to somebody who's sick, vulnerable, and may, who may get serious illness. Now, the question of where to go, uh, depending on what you have. I mean, if you really feel ill, 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 um, and you might feel I have to go to an A and E or I have to go to an, an emergency department, or should I stay at home and just take paracetamol and hot drinks, mm-hmm. or I slide on my pavement with a bit of ice or whatever and crack my noggin, or break a, a limb or fracture something? What do I do? Where do I go? Because you really don't want to add to the overcrowding if you can possibly avoid it. No, and, and exactly right. We've we've tried and we were building on capacity over the years, and particularly this year, to avoid congestion, not of people, but of risk in emergency departments. So, so can we, offer, we can offer alternatives to people depending, corresponding to what injury or illness they have. Urgent emergency centres, emergency departments, the clue is what entitled. It's for urgent and emergency care. We have 13 local injury units across the country, Model 2 hospitals, some standalone, such as in Grana, Brown and Cork, and they're well-placed and, and can serve people. But are they open when people need them? They're I mean, if, you're, if you fall at nine o'clock at night, are those places open? They're open from eight to eight. They're open seven days a week and they're able to deal with fractures from knees down to the ankles, from shoulders down to the fingers. Uh, they don't deal with deal with a serious brain injury. They don't deal with abdominal pain, uh, chest pain, but they deal with wounds, all kinds of minor injuries. And so much so, as people have got used to them over the years, that sometimes people can defer going to the local injury unit until it opens the following morning at eight o'clock. Sure. I mean, uh, I obviously haven't been through A&E um, myself with a daughter. I can see... You know, some people were there. They were not going to be seen till the next day anyway with a, a fracture. Nothing was going to be done for them and they might have been better off at home. You're, if it's a minor injury, if it's a, and, and their information is all available on the HC website, uh, you can access there during the, during the opening hours or you can wait till the following morning if it's uh, and, and there's advice on the HC website as to what to do if you've got swelling, a sprain or a suspected fracture. All right, because sitting in a chair overnight is... It's, it's, certainly it's not, not going to help you if it, you're not going to be treated. Our emergency departments are there for people who need urgent and emergency care. If, you, if your care can be provided somewhere else, uh, then it's better to go directly to that centre rather than wait a protracted period of time in the emergency department. Now, some of the advice that was issued uh, in the past week was about not going with a, a companion to A&E if you can make it on your own because even people sitting on chairs as a companion to someone who's injured 
is adding to the overcrowding. Well, we recognise everybody, uh, you know, there's very few people are able to go to emergency departments by de- because of what's wrong with them by themselves. Yeah. So people will need uh, uh, relatives, lo- loved ones and so on to go with them to emergency departments. We're just a- asking people to be mindful of that, that, that this is a place where there's a, a, a congestion of risk and, and there are many sick people and you don't know, if, if particularly if you're symptomatic, please don't go uh, unless you're actually seeking medical attention yourself. But if you, have no, if you have no reason to be there other than supporting somebody who's, who needs your support, please avoid yeah. going there. I mean, you can drop them off or whatever, yes. but then uh, depart and stay in touch by phone. At the INMO, General Secretary Philly Hay said oppressive overcrowding is no longer something that's confined to one or two hospitals. As she says, we're seeing overcrowding challenges in each part of the country with this predicted to get worse as the week goes on. So are we in trouble here? We, we certainly see, we're certainly seeing uh, uh, this morning over 400 trolleys. But what, we, what we're seeing this year is a dispersal of that risk of emergency departments. We're on daily calls right over Christmas with all hospitals and community authorities, ensuring that people are, that the flow of patients through hospital is maximised as much as possible to avoid, avoid people being admitted to hospital and to expedite their discharge. And we're, uh, we've brought in new measures, including um, what we call a full capacity protocol, which means that if there's trolleys, Trolleys congested in ED, those trolleys can then be dispersed throughout the wards of the hospital. Okay, so they will still be on a trolley. And a trolley is really a hospital bed. Uh, I mean, it's not like um, a stretcher. It's well, it's not something any of us want to stand by. It's we, we much prefer to get people admitted to a proper medical bed, including with some what we call yeah. surge beds that are in areas that are designated, for example, for surgical uh, day op- uh, uh, operations and so on, but that can be redesignated as acute beds during a surge of virus. Well, obviously, you that. also don't want to bring infection from ED up to one of the wards where some of these trolleys... Uh, might be dispersed. No, and we're trying during this, particularly high levels of community transmission, we see higher levels of outbreaks and as such, uh, it it has always been a struggle for us to try and maintain and to suppress the outbreaks uh, as much as we can because of the risk to patients who are immunosuppressed within hospital. But our hospitals are working hard, I can assure you, based on those engagements. I was in Galway the other day, uh, making sure they cohort patients with known infection, they they avoid transmission between emergency departments and wards and that they observe IPC, as we call it, protocols at all times. What about, uh, I think Bernard Gloucester was talking about the seven-day working week. In other words, you have full personnel. uh, You would obviously maybe need more manpower, but that a Saturday or a Sunday or a bank holiday is going to operate in a hospital as an ordinary Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. When is that going to come about? Because that would certainly expedite um, releasing people uh, who are better or at least could be stepped down either to home or to somewhere else. Certainly over this Christmas period and right through January, we're seeing six, seven hour day w- working. We're seeing levels of weekend discharges we didn't see before. Our trolley numbers for the last six months of 2023 were down 22% from the previous uh, same era, the year before. And the particular focus we have on those who are aged over 75 years of age on protracted stays in trolleys, we saw a big big drop. And this is because we're senior decision makers who are always there, supported by all the support staff they need and supported by their colleagues in the community are coming in Saturdays and Sundays, discharging patients, avoiding admissions, expediting the flow of patients through emergency departments and through wards. Because we, we were always a bit dismayed that the, the fact that this wasn't happening, that people were occupying a hospital bed when they were fit to go, that uh, the senior medical people didn't understand that they could alleviate their colleagues' pressure by coming in and discharging. I think there's a very, very high level of understanding now. And in our conversations with them, um, especially following sometimes serious incidents we've seen in emergency departments, it's the, the mantra has been from us and from our clinical colleagues, you can't expect all the risks to be contained with emergency departments. It's not safe. It's not fair. Every, it's everybody's job, not just our colleagues in the emergency department.